Family Treasury of Classic Tales, Princess Stories, by Flowerpot Press, designed by Stephanie Mayers. The Story of Cinderella There once lived a gentleman who on becoming a widower married a most haughty woman for his second wife. The lady had two daughters by a former marriage, equally proud and disagreeable as herself. While the husband had one daughter of the sweetest temper and most angelic disposition, no sooner was the wedding over than the stepmother began to show her bad temper. She could not bear her stepdaughter's good qualities. That only showed up her daughter's unfavorable ones still more obviously. And she accordingly compelled the poor girl to do all the drudgery of the household. It was she who washed the dishes and scrubbed down the stairs and polished the floors in my lady's chamber and in those of her two daughters. And while the latter slept on good feather beds in elegant rooms, furnished with full-length looking glasses, their sister lay in a wretched loft on an old straw mattress. Yet the poor thing bore this ill treatment very meekly and did not dare complain to her father when he returned from his frequent journeys. When her work was done, she would to sit in the chimney corner amongst the cinders, which had caused the nickname of Cinderella to be given her by the family. Yet, for all her shabby clothes, Cinderella was a hundred times prettier than her stepsisters. It happened that the king's son gave a ball to which he invited all the nobility, and as our two young ladies made a great figure in the world, they were included in the list of invitations. So they began to be very busy choosing which gown would be the most becoming. Here was fresh work for poor Cinderella, for it was she who was to starch and get up their ruffles and iron all their fine linen and nothing but dress was talked about for days together. I, said the eldest, shall put on my red velvet dress with my point lace trimmings. And I, said the younger sister, shall wear my usual petticoat, but shall set it off with my gold brocaded train and my circlet of diamonds. They called in Cinderella for her advice, and she had such good taste. And Cinderella not only advised them well, but also offered to dress their hair, which they were pleased to accept. While she was busy with this, the sisters said to her, Oh, Cinderella, would you like to go to the ball? No, you are teasing me, replied the poor girl. It is not for such as I to go to the balls. True enough, they chuckled. Folks would laugh to see a Cinderella at a court ball. Anyone other than Cinderella would have made their hair a mess to punish them for their impertinence. But she was so good natured that she made them both look fabulous. The long wished for evening came at last and off they set. Cinderella's eyes followed them as long as she could and then she began to weep. Her godmother now, now appeared, and seeing her in tears, inquired what was the matter. I wish, I wish, began the poor girl, but tears choke her utterance. You wish that you could go to the ball? interrupted her grandmother, who was a fairy. Indeed, I, I do said Cinderella with a sigh. Well then, if you will be a good girl, you shall go, said her godmother. Now fetch me a pumpkin from the garden. Cinderella flew to gather the finest pumpkin she could find. 
though she could not understand how it was going to help her to get to the ball. But her grandmother simply touched it with her wand and it was immediately changed into golden coach. She then went to the mouse trap where she found six live mice and bidding Cinderella let them out once one by one. She changed each mouse into a fine dapple gray horse by a stroke of her wand. With another stroke of her wand, she turned a fine rat who happened to have a tremendous pair of whiskers into a coachman with the finest moustache ever seen. She then said, Now go into the garden and bring me six lizards, which you will find behind the watering pot. These were no sooner brought than they were turned into six footmen who got up behind the coach just as naturally as if they had done nothing else all their lives. The fairy godmother then said to Cinderella, Off you go then, you're all set for the ball. But must I go in these dirty clothes? said Cinderella timidly. Her godmother merely touched her with a wand and her shabby clothes were changed to a dress of gold and silver tissue, all ornamented with precious stones. For her feet, she gave her the prettiest pair of glass slippers ever seen. As Cinderella got into the carriage, her fairy godmother warned her not to stay beyond midnight. As, should she remain a moment longer at the ball, her coach would again become a pumpkin her horses mice, her footmen lizards, while her clothes would return to their former shabby condition. Cinderella promised she would not fail to leave the ball before midnight and set off in delight. When Cinderella's horse-drawn carriage arrived at the ball, the king's son was informed that some great princess, unknown at court, had just arrived and went to hand her out of her carriage and brought her into the hall where she company was assembled. The moment she appeared, all conversation was hushed. The violins ceased playing and the dancing stopped short. So great was the sensation produced by the stranger's beauty. A confused murmur of admiration fluttered through the crowd and many exclaimed, How surpassingly lovely she is! Even the king, old as he was, could not forbear admiring her like the rest, and whispered to the queen that she was certainly the fairest and comeliest woman he had seen for many a long day. The ladies were all busy examining her headdress and her clothes, in order to get similar ones the very next day. After leading her to the place to which her rank seemed to entitle her, the king's son requested her hand for the next dance, and she displayed so much grace as to increase the admiration her beauty had raised in the first instance. An elegant supper was next brought in, but the young prince was so taken up with gazing at the fair stranger that he did not partake of a morsel. Throughout the evening, the king's son never left Cinderella's side and kept paying her the most flattering attentions. The young lady was just as taken with him. So it came to pass that she forgot her godmother's warning and indeed lost track of the time so completely that before she thought it could be 11 o'clock, she was startled at hearing the first stroke of midnight. In the middle of the waltz, she pulled herself out of the prince's arms and flew away like a startled fawn. The prince attempted to follow her, but she was too swift for him. Only, as she flew, she dropped one of her glass slippers, which he picked up very eagerly. Cinderella reached home, reached, reached home quite out of breath, without either coach or footman, and with only her shabby clothes on her back. Nothing, in short, 
remained of her recent magnificence, save a little glass slipper, the match to the one she had lost. On reaching home, she found her godmother and thanked her profusely for the wonderful night. She was still relating to her godmother all that had happened at court when her two sisters knocked at the door. Cinderella went and let them in, pretending to yawn and to stretch herself and rub her eyes and saying, How late you are! Just as if she was woke up out of a nap, though truth to say she had never felt less disposed to sleep in her life. If you had been to the ball, said one of the sisters, you would not have thought in it late. There came the most beautiful princess ever seen, who knew us by name. Cinderella could scarcely contain her delight and inquired the name of the princess, but they replied that nobody knew her name and that the king's son was in great trouble about her and would give the world to know who she is, she could be. They told Cinderella that the beautiful princess had run away as soon as midnight had struck, and so quickly as to drop one of her dainty glass slippers, which the king's son had picked up and was looking at most fondly during the remainder of the ball. Indeed, it seemed beyond a doubt that he was deeply enamored of the beautiful creature to whom it belonged. They spoke truly enough, for a few days afterwards, the king's son caused a proclamation to be made. By sound of trumpet, all over the kingdom, to the effect that he would marry her whose foot should be found to fit the slipper exactly. So the slipper was first tried on by all the princesses, then by all the duchesses, and next by all the persons belonging to the court, but in vain. It was then carried to the two sisters, who tried with all their might to force their feet into its delicate proportions, but with no better success. Cinderella, who was present and recognized her slipper, now laughed and said, Suppose I were to try. Her sisters ridiculed such an idea, but the gentleman who was appointed to try the slipper, having looked attentively at Cinderella and perceived how beautiful she was, said that it was but fair she should do so, and he had orders to try it on every young maiden in the kingdom. Accordingly, having requested Cinderella to sit down, she no sooner put her little foot to the slipper than she drew it on, and it fit like a glove. The sisters were quite amazed, but their astonishment increased tenfold when Cinderella drew the fellow slipper out of her pocket and put it on. Her, her grandmother, godmother then made her appearance and having touched Cinderella's clothes with her wand made them still more magnificent than those she had previously worn. Her two sisters now recognized her for the beautiful stranger they had seen at the ball and falling at her feet, implored her forgiveness for their unworthy treatment and all of the insults they had heaped upon her head. Cinderella raised them, saying as she embraced them, that she not only forgave them with all her heart, but wished for their affection. She was taken to the palace of the young prince, in whose eyes she appeared yet more lovely than before, and who married her shortly after. Cinderella, who was as good as she was beautiful, allowed her sisters to lodge in the palace and gave them in marriage that same day to two lords belonging to the court, and they all lived happily ever after. The End